Good evening. All we seem to talk about around these parts at the moment is Brexit. But away from the spotlight, there is plenty more going on domestically. One of those being the biggest change to our welfare system in a generation. So up for discussion tonight. Families from Gloucestershire to Cornwall say they're struggling to put food on the table because of the government's new benefits system. Plus, back in Brussels, Theresa May looks for concessions on her Brexit plan as the Yeovil MP is among those trying to change it. And five years on from the railway line being cut off at Dawlish, what needs to be done to improve our transport links? And joining me for tonight's West Country debate, we have the Bristol South MP, Labour's Karen Smith, alongside her and for the Conservatives, the Cotswolds MP, Sir Geoffrey Clifton-Brown, and Kirsten Johnson, who's hoping to win back the North Devon constituency for the Liberal Democrats at the next election, whenever that is. Good evening Good to evening. you all. Well, I know it seems like Brexit is the only topic of conversation in Westminster these days, but we're going to make a change tonight and kick off the show with something different, universal credit. This is the government's flagship reform of the benefits system, rolling together six benefits, including unemployment benefit, tax credits and the housing benefit into one monthly payment. Across the West Country right now, nearly 125,000 people are on the system. Plymouth has the highest proportion with more than 12,000 and Swindon comes in second. In a moment, we'll We'll hear from my guests but first let's hear from Emma from Gloucestershire who's recently moved on to the system and says she is having to manage with £257 less every month. It's, it's a struggle I'm now having to go to food banks um, and food banks aren't meant to see you through they had to take me over Christmas but they're not meant to feed you for weeks on end food banks are what exactly what they are they're for emergencies. When you're looking in your cupboard, you've got no cereal and you've got a child that's going, I'm starving. It rips your heart apart. It really does rip your heart apart. <laughs> it has got to the point where I'm thinking, do you know what? I just, I don't want to do it anymore. My daughter is better off without me and going to somebody that can afford to look after her. So she didn't have to feel that she'd become a parent and I'd become the child. Sorry. <laughs> Now, Karen Smith, Labour has called for a pause in the rollout of universal credit. If we can just start this by stepping back away from the political divides here, the very basic principle of universal credit, monthly payments, helping people back into work, is that the right kind of benefit system for this day and age? I think there was a lot of optimism around trying to help people back into work and I mean, that's a good thing. Most people want to work. There's a lot of dignity in work for supporting your family. But what we've seen is some basic design flaws. Um, coupled into that is some really savage financial cuts which Ian Duncan Smith, the architect of this entire benefit system, then resigned over, if we can remember. So we want to pause and review what comes... I mean, it's heartbreaking listening to Emma. What, what I see regularly and what I'm particularly concerned about is people who cannot work, who have been proven by various authorities that they can't work for whatever reason, um, normally a disability. They are having to still jump through all these hoops to prove that. And the number of appeals in this system... I've got one constituent. He successfully appealed three times against this system. It's hugely costly and wasteful. And causing people real desperation. It's a real big problem in, in my email list and my phone calls to my office. There are around a thousand people, uh, Sir Geoffrey Clifford Brown, in Sirencester on universal credits and it's a fairly small amount um, at the moment. People who are on other benefits aren't being moved across. That's due to happen in the next few years. But what would you say to, uh, to Emma and people who are struggling because of this new system? Well, of course, nobody wants to see uh, similar situations to Emma's. But on the whole, the, it must be right. When I was uh, dealing with those six benefits that you talked about, I can remember people in utter misery uh, with difficulty getting on one uh, or the other or on both and not getting what they thought. I mean, my constituency post bag was horrendous. So it's got to be the right thing to do. Now, I accept what Karen says. When you're introducing such a big new system, inevitably in the transfer, there are going to be problems. And that's why the government has had a pilot scheme. It's why it's already made some changes. I've no doubt that before it's finished, there will be more changes. But it's got to be the right thing to do to try and simplify it. And at the same time, give somebody a dedicated person trying to help them 
system where it's applicable to get into work because where you've got a breadwinner in the family, uh, families tend to be better off. But it is six years now. It's six years. Well, it's that, a very that, big change. Like... I mean, what we're going to do is stay as we were under Labour where the benefits bill went up by £80 billion in real terms in today's money or do you do, try and do something different? And that's what we're trying to do here and I think ultimately it will benefit uh, some of those like Emma, uh, uh, ultimately it will benefit them. Uh, Kirsten, let's bring you in. Uh, Sir Vince Cable, your party leader, has yeah. said he wants the rollout paused, yes. not universal credit got rid of. Yes. W would you agree with him? Yeah, the concept of universal credit is a good one in that it does bring benefits together so that people get a single payment. So we're, we're fine with that. But the way it's actually been implemented has been horrendous. And people in North Devon and across our constituencies are really suffering, not just Emma. But I've been visiting the food banks in North Devon and in South Moulton and listening to those stories. And it's hard working people and they can't make ends meet because they're not being paid enough. I mean, North Devon is a low wage economy anyway. The average wage is around £20,000 compared to the national average of 27000 House prices are 11 times what somebody would earn. So people are struggling in work and universal credit is not working for them. Now the government's done the rollout very slowly. At the moment the only people on it are people who have either moved um, houses, have changed ch or had another sort of change in circumstance. Is it not right the government's rolled it out seemingly fairly slowly, which is how the system could be improved? So I've been talking to people who are at the call face and implementing this in North Devon and in Ilfracombe, which is one of the towns to the northern part of our constituency. There's a lady there working for a charity and they're getting referred people to help them on to Universal Credit, as you've explained, because it's now a digital platform. And she says people coming through the door don't have basic computer literacy, mm. so they need someone to sit next to them, guide them through the process. Right. She's gotten onto North Devon Council and saying, wait a minute, you're supposed to be doing this for them. Mm -hmm. They've said that Department of Work and Pensions have cut all the funding, or at least cut it back such, to such a scale that they have to refer people to the charity who doesn't have enough resource to help people get on the platform. What Lib Dems are saying is that rather than telling people they have to apply for universal credit for their own existing benefits, this migration platform that mm -hmm. the Conservatives have suggested, we should automatically put them onto universal credit and take that bit out of the system so that there isn't a gap in payments. That's the problem that people are having to wait for these payments. And one of the campaigners to close that gap in payments and extra money has been put in by the Chancellor in, in the most recent budget. Johnny Mercer, the Plymouth Moor View MP, was one of those who's campaigned for change. Let's quickly hear from him. There are still, in my view, too many uh, cases of uh, people who are going without, who are asked to live on, uh, clearly not enough. Um, you know, there are too many mistakes for me to comfortably say that this policy is being done properly, which is why I work so hard whenever these cases come out um, to understand exactly what has gone wrong um, to fix it. Because uh, for me, this is a, a good policy. It is a life-changing policy. It is a policy that should be the defining marker of a modern Conservative Party. Uh, Sir Geoffrey Clifton. Yeah, so can I answer that? Yes. Uh, so that's why the government have made changes, as I indicated in my opening remarks. The chance has given one and a half billion pounds to try and reduce. Is that enough? Uh, maybe not, I don't know, uh, but it has had the effect of reducing from five to six, six, uh, six to five weeks. Uh, he's given £39 million pounds to citizens' advice bureaus to do exactly what Kirsten was complaining about, to give it's people the enough. help. Um, uh, it may not be enough, but at least it's a start to give people the help uh, filling in these forms. And don't forget, I sit, uh, as Karen used to, on the Public Accounts Committee. This is a vast amount of money this benefit's going to cover, £60 billion. Pounds. Uh, uh, Karen knows from sitting on the Public Accounts Committee, we have to be sure that this money is going to those who it's intended for. We cannot afford to have fraud in the system, which is why we have to have proper checks. Now, the government has paused its rollout to everyone who is on another sort of uh, benefit system. And you will soon be asked in the House of Commons to allow a few thousand to be tra transferred before allowing the rest of the nearly three million people. Is it right the government's doing that? Will you be able to support that? We, we would like a greater pause and, and review of the system because there are some basic design flaws in the system as well. And we've got particularly, changes, well, yeah, it? but they're not enough. Um, that we've had a number of pilots. What's surprising me in my office is that despite all the pilots, we're still uncovering new problems. Some of that's to do with bureaucracy. It's to do with the interplay between, for example, the tax office, HMR and the City Council or the DWP um, and that's not properly worked out you know I had a constituent who's blind who was written to by letter to tell her that it include her
her rent. These are basic things that are affecting people. I mean, I would agree with John. Each case is coming forward and throwing up some new things. That's why we think there are some basic design flaws. But the Citizens Advice Bureau in the House of Commons, MenCap, um, Kirsten's right, people are having to have help sitting in front of a computer. South Bristol Advice Centre in my constituency have to sit with people all the time to help them through the forms. So, so that's more than just the money. That is about the design of the system. OK, and I'm sure if we weren't talking about Brexit all the time, we would be talking about universal credit a lot more the, uh, in the Commons than we have been recently. But let's move on to the B word, because it is exactly 50 days to go until we leave, or are set to leave, the European Union. Theresa May has been in Brussels today to meet various senior politicians to send them the message that the current insurance policy to avoid a hard border on Ireland needs changing. And both sides have confirmed their teams will start talks to try and break the deadlock. While back home, Marcus Fish, the Yeovil MP is part of a small group of Conservatives trying to help the government come up with a new plan. So Geoffrey Clifton Brown, let's come to you first. You backed the amendment uh, two weeks ago or nearly, uh, for the Theresa May to go back to Brussels like she is doing today. Yes. Do you think she can get the changes to get enough of your colleagues on side? Well, the simple answer, nobody knows until we do get those changes. I believe in my heart that she will get a, a change and I believe that the House of Commons will vote, having got a change on the clarification of the backstop, I believe there was a sufficient majority for the Brady Amendment last week to show that if she got that change we could get a deal through the House of Commons and then I believe that uh, we need to change the law and uh, move on. Now if I remember rightly you signed that amendment as well as I voted did. for it. it. It said the backstop as it's become known, the insurance policy to avoid this hard border between Ireland uh, on the, on the uh, island of Ireland. If it's a legal change outside of the withdrawal agreement, which is what is being suggested and the EU may be more likely to do, is that enough, do you think, for your colleagues to vote for? Well, I think provided the Attorney General provides a very uh, clear statement that this is legally binding, whatever concessions she gets, to my mind it needs to say something that gives us the ability to be able to leave the backstop so with a time, limit, or time a limit of some sort, or a mechanism that we can unilaterally get out of it. The fear of colleagues who voted against the deal was that we're going to be stuck in there uh, for a long time, subject to the rules of the EU, and not being able to influence those rules. Kirsten, if I bring you in, something that really interests me, you, you want to represent a, a, a Leave vote constituency in a Leave uh, mm. county, mm. a party that wants a second referendum and ideally wants to remain inside the European Union. How can you, how do you balance that? How do that? I square the circle? Huh? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what, I've been talking to lots of people in North Devon and I very much get why a lot of people voted Leave. In fact, there are Liberal Democrats who voted Leave in North Devon. So, you know, the party isn't completely unanimous there and as well. And are they well. still Liberal Democrats now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so I, I I get it. Um, but what I think is that we have divided communities. You know, I'm talking to farmers and they're divided over this. Some of them regret having voted leave. Some of them want to leave with no deal at all. Some of them like Theresa May's deal. There's still a lot of division there. And we've had families fall out with each other. And the tensions within the communities in North Devon really, really bother me. And I think we need closure, and I think the only way to have closure is to have a vote. That way it's, it's square, and everybody knows what leave means. The problem with the original referendum is that leave meant a lot of things to a lot of different people. Now we know what leave means. We have Mrs. May's deal that she's worked two and a half years for. We can put that on the paper, say, do you like this? Do you want it? And if so, I'm happy to represent them, because I'll have a mandate that that's what they want. But right now, I'm being told a lot of different versions of leave, and I don't really know what my constituents want. OK, let's come back into the House of Commons. And one way to to get a deal through is to get all the Conservatives to go through the voting lobbies. Another way is to get Labour on side. And very helpfully, your leader wrote to the Prime Minister this morning with a five-point plan. Let's take a look at some of the uh, points that he has said to Theresa May would help get across. So a UK-wide customs union, but with the ability to make trade deals he uh, with the other countries. Single market alignment, so effectively a softer Brexit. Uh, rights and protections for UK citizens and goods. Uh, what he also is looking for is security arrangements between the EU and the UK and finally um, membership of UK agencies on education, environment regulation for example. Some of your colleagues, I don't know whether you did, were unaware that letter was happening before it was publicised, but what do you think of the letter? Well, you know, we've been, Jeremy asked Theresa May to join us in a call for a UK customs union last September, last October, in our party conference. We've been talking about those things uh, for at least two years. That's basically saying the red lines you put in, Prime Minister, which you should never have done, you can't have those red lines. That is stopping any kind of arrangement. And I, I don't think anybody's clear, even after her visit to Northern Ireland uh, yesterday. What exactly is she asking for? Because as Geoffrey says, some of his colleagues are asking 
asking for um, you know changes to the so-called backstop but that only exists one because the Prime Minister negotiated it but secondly unless and until there is a future relationship and that future relationship which we still don't know what the Conservative government wants we still don't know that in in a few weeks time that has to involve for us customs union and single market alignment on those key issues around regulations which are so important for that northern irish border now in gloucester today we had the chancellor philip hammond who responded to jeremy corbyn's letter let's hear what he had to say it rather raises more questions than it answers we do need answers from jeremy corbyn to questions like where he now stands on freedom of movement. He said in his manifesto that Labour would end freedom of movement and yet the ideas he's putting forward now, a customs union, uh, close uh, alignment on single market regulations, suggests uh, that he may be willing to accept uh, freedom of movement. So we need him to be clear, to come clean about what his position is overall. Come straight back to you, Karen. Could you ever see yourself well, walking through a lobby just, with him? I then? just just think it's astonishing, isn't it? We've had two and a half years. That that's the Chancellor. That's the Chancellor of our country, of our government. And all he's got to say is he wants to know what the leader of the opposition's clarity on, on one part of that proposal. I mean, I just find it astonishing that this Conservative government has been allowed to just try and move everything back to, to us and to other people when he, can't, when he knows that he can't even talk to his own people. So it's all very well him saying, you know, let, let us clarify that further. Jeremy's put those five points forward. But what, what is he going to ask for? What does he think the future is? What is, his, what is his point on the customs union? What does he really think about these so-called free trade agreements outside the remit of the European Union? We need to start asking them some questions. I find that really quite a laughable response from Philip Hammond. Very briefly, because we need to move on, but just quickly defend your Chancellor. Well, um, Go on, give it a go. <laughs> I think that actually Jeremy Corbyn doesn't understand how the pro process works. Actually, a lot of this business, customs union and so on, is in the future partnership. What we need to do is come up with a deal and leave and then talk about the future partnership. So get partnership. out and then sort out what's Sort next. it out. And if Jeremy Corbyn understood that, I made it very clear in the House of Commons in my question to the Prime Minister the other day, if you're a member of a customs union, you can't do international trade deals. That is not what we voted to come out for. Very, very briefly. And the Labour conference agreed that if they did not get a general election, they would go for a people's vote. So I'd like to know why Corbyn is not now calling for a people's vote. Parliament has not sorted this it's out after two table. and a half it's years. It's still on the it's table. And table. maybe don't, don't, not, well, well, know, on Valentine's Day, there'll be a series of votes in the we House of Commons and we might work left. this out. I think if there was a majority in the House of Commons left. for a second vote, we'd have had it last There's week. a majority in the House of Commons for a customs union. We were within six votes of a vote last July and the government whipped against. We need the government to be very clear what they want our arrangements to be and only two years after that withdrawal agreement finishes. We don't know what the future arrangement is. We will not, can't support a blind Brexit. Let's that get is out with a deal. Problem. Let's get out with well, a deal there are, first. There are a number of votes next week. We might be a bit clearer, although I somehow <laughs> doubt it next week. But let's move on because this week marks five years since storms cut much of Devon and Cornwall's railway line off from the rest of the country. Few can forget these pictures of the line at Dawlish swinging above the waves. Uh, this week an application for planning permission has been put in to raise the height of the sea wall. And the topic of Dawlish has come up in Parliament numerous times this week in a variety of debates. For me this has taken at least 12 months too long and the region has become impatient. This will be fine provided we get what we are looking for next week. This was images that are permanently fixed in our minds, those of us that live down there that were cut off for several weeks. I would really like this opportunity to say to the Minister that we must make progress. Uh, we will not be forgiven if we see another catastrophe like that. Five years on, we've had sound bites of plenty. We've had press releases and promises coming out of our ears. I was really hoping that we would have had a funding announcement to coincide with the five-year anniversary to show that ministers got this. The investment which I have to say has been long overdue in the resilience of that vital route uh, that connects the South West Peninsula uh, with the rest of the country. And I understand that funding announcement is due in the next couple of weeks. Let's come to you first. Yes. The current North Devon MP yes. there, he went on to say that he wants to see improvements into his constituency of railway access. What would your, be your priority if and, you were to replace him? Oh, absolutely. Um, not only improving the existing Barnstable to Exeter line, which is a bit like an Agatha Christie film when you go rickety, rickety, rick through the tiny little villages, but also I would support the campaign for better transport, which yesterday launched a campaign saying we need five billion invested across the country 
country to open unused rail lines. And that would directly affect North Devon because it would actually reopen the line from Barnstable to Ilfracombe, not only helping students get back and forth to college, but also all the tourists that want to go up and down the beaches, as well as local businesses. So we'd lo like that open. We'd like to reopen the Barnstable to Taunton line because this morning to get here, I had to get in a car to drive to Tiverton to get the fast train up to Paddington. And so you need to get people like me out of my cars and onto rail. So let's open the Barnstable to Ta Taunton line. And there was two other lines as well, Barnstable to Biddeford and Barnstable to Bronton. The Bronton one's very important because Bronton, I don't know if you've ever been to the beach in Saunton Sands, it's one of the most beautiful beaches, mm -hmm. but it's a pinch point mm -hmm. in summer mm -hmm. months because it's the only way to get to Saunton Sands Beach. Mm -hmm. Air quality, pollution, it's a massive problem because we're not having the investment in proper public infrastructure. Mm. Uh, Jeff, let's come to you. Alex Chalk, one of your uh, neighbours, was saying that he uh, wants quicker journey times from your part of the world um, on trains in a debate the other day. I is he right? Is, is there well, a problem the, there? What Kirsten said is just rubbish. Uh, the National Infrastructure Delivery Plan foreshadowed what is being delivered now, a hundred billion pounds of investment into infrastructure between 2016 and 2021. The most, the biggest rail improvement program since Victorian times, 48 billion. 28.8 billion announced for the roads program 20 to 20 to 2025 in the budget this time. Uh, major improvements to the M5 which will benefit uh, Devon. Uh, junctions 49, junctions 16, junctions 10. Uh, major expansion of Bristol Airport. I mean there are huge uh, electrification of the line from Paddington to Swansea. Not huge, Bristol, but huge, 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 Devon. huge <laughs> infrastructure project, projects going on, not least of which I hope a big one in my constituency, the air balloon missing. Which is something you've campaigned for, for very long time. Very briefly before I bring Karen in, um, obviously some of the problems that you talk about connecting mm. rural communities, Absolutely. you have some rural areas. Yeah. Do you think, yes, all this money, government says record investment, but is it doing enough in the more rural areas? No. Well, in my area, if we get that link from the M4 to the M5, that will be an enormous benefit. Uh, uh, Karen's, uh, uh, Kirsten's decrying the amount spent. Uh, Peter Heaton Jones, the present member of Parliament, got 58 million on the North Devon Link Road. The Liberals got nothing that's in perfect. their time. It's not what it means. Uh, but it's 58 million. Come on, that's no small amount of money for North Devon. Well, so you have, you driven the, uh, have you driven the North well, Link Road recently? <laughs> and let's bring in Karen. But obviously, a, a very different constituency. Um, the electrification that's been mentioned, yes, it hasn't quite gone into certain parts of Bristol. Um, what uh, pollution a big issue? I mean, I talked about this when I was on the Public Accounts Committee. You know, we're, we're talking about um, looking at pollution and charging cars, possibly in the future. Then we're bringing these diesel diesel trains in. But I, I would agree with Kirsten. I think, particularly for young people that aren't in cars, uh, linking up those um, routes in, in in the summer and getting to those fantastic beaches would be a really good thing. Um, and you know, we we we've heard this. Bristol is a net contributor to the Exchequer in terms of of, of, of money we we pay back, and we are being shortchanged. We're not getting the infrastructure development, both in through the electrification, but also around the wider network out through, for example, you know, parts of my constituency as well. All right, plenty to disagree on. There I'm is. afraid we are Absolutely. just out of time. We must leave it there. My thanks to Karen Smith, to Sir Geoffrey Clifton-Brown and Kirsten Johnson. Thank you all for Thank coming. You. We are back next month. For now, good night.